Hi, this is Rich Sierra, president of Florida Small Business Legal Center. If you're watching the uh, podcast via video, you'll see that I'm in a different location. Today, due to the weather in South Florida, I'm now recording from the Popeye Studios in Boca Raton like we do every week. But today I'm recording from my office here in Boca Raton, Florida, the Florida Small Business Legal Center. So welcome to the show. This is episode number 57 of Business SOS. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, today, we're going to talk about what to look for and mistakes to avoid when buying shares in an LLC from a neighbor or a friend. And uh, I'll give you some anecdote to start with. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I received an email from a prospective client that apparently bought some shares on an LLC. And this person paid you know, over $100,000 for these shares and uh, from a neighbor and uh, somebody that the person knew very well. And uh, what happened was that he hasn't, she hasn't heard anything from the company or from an individual as to what happened to the company, uh, whether the company is making money, has not received any financials, has not received any type of reporting, uh, no K-1 reports. Uh, so, you know, this client does not know what's happening to her money. So she came to me and I'm like, okay, let me ask you a number of questions. And, you know, first I looked at the document and it was very, a one page or two page document regarding the transfer of shares. Uh, I asked where the money went to, the money went to the LLC, the money went to the individuals, the seller's account. It went to the seller's account. Uh, and I said, uh, do you have an opportunity to review the operating agreement of the company? And the answer was, no, I don't have any information that you had any financials, P&Ls. No, uh, I just thought that we had we're working on an invention, and uh, I thought it was a good place to invest my money, and uh, I decided to do it, and I trusted him. Uh, you know, now we're in the process of finding out what happened, uh, but I hear these stories very frequently, and the situation that you have here is that there's a failure of due diligence, and it's very common, especially during the holidays that people get together, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, people begin to get together and they begin to kind of say, listen, I have this business deal, you wanna invest, you wanna partner with me in this deal. And you know, because everybody knows each other, there's formalities that are ignored or they're overlooked uh, that should take place when uh, transferring ownership on an LLC to another individual. Uh, and but when those things don't happen, and then there's no attorneys involved, uh, then you have a situation where people end up coming to my office and I said, asking, telling me, okay, what what are my rights here? You know, I spend over hundred thousand dollars buying this interest in this company, and what do I do? So then that's where the conversation begins. But it's very common, you know, that I receive those inquiries. And it's also very common that people invest in companies, uh, buy ownership interest in private companies, not talking about public companies here, really talking about, you know, privately owned companies, your small business, LLC, your corporation, that people are looking for money. And then in good faith, they provide that money, trusting the individual that's selling that interest and finding out that maybe the money was not used for what it's intended to, or finding out that the, uh, you know, the company really was not what it's originally intended to do. So I want to talk about that for the next uh, 25, 30 minutes. And again, I appreciate you listening to me. And as I open the show, if you have any legal questions that you'd like to ask me, uh, please send me an email at rich at richsierra.com. Again, it's rich at richsierra.com. If I select your question and I answer the question in the show, and we'll go over that. I'll send you a free copy of my book, Business SOS, A Common Legal Mistakes, Business Owners Make and How to Avoid Them, which is available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. You can ask for any local bookstores. So let's begin. First of all, what is an, what is an LLC? LLC is a limited liability company. Uh, it differs from other business structures like a corporation. Instead of having shareholders, you have members of the LLC. Uh, and it combines... Uh, the protection of a limited liability company, you know, basically you don't have individual protection, but there's some tax benefits, but we're not going to discuss those right now. 
We led that to a CPA to discuss the advantages of owning an LLC. Uh, but more importantly is that you as the member of the LLC are not liable for uh, liabilities of the company. Uh, you individual are not liable for that unless you sign a personal guarantee. But otherwise, corporate debts are corporate debts. They're not individual debts. And you have the same thing with any type of litigation. To the extent that a company gets sued and you have a, a situation that the LLC may be liable to another party for damages, you individually are not liable for those damages because it was the LLC's responsibility. Just kind of giving you a big picture here that of what a limited liability company is. So you have members, the LLC can be managed by members, which are the owners of the LLC, or the managers. Managers are appointed by the members. So the members of the LLC are the shareholders of a corporation, similar, I'm just giving you an analogy of that. And then you appoint managers who basically run the LLC if you want to do that, or it can be member managed, which basically the members are the ones that manage the LLC. So another uh, point that I like to make is that it's very common for LLCs to have an operating agreement. Uh, operating agreement is really the, the, the document that governs how that LLC is going to be running, how it's going to be, how it's going to run, uh, who's going to be responsible for contracting, who's going to be responsible for the, the inter taxes, who's going to be responsible to be the principal officer of the company, who's going to have authority to enter into contracts, uh, check writing, all that goes into the operating agreement. You also have a who, the, who's going to be owning the LLC. Uh, who are the members? Who are percentage of ownership? What decisions are made unanimously? What decisions are made with the authority of uh, the majority of the members? Though all that is in the operating agreement, and that's something that we do here in my office and help LLCs prepare those documents, and they're very important documents. Uh, so I'm giving you kind of a big overview because I'm going to talk a little about due diligence, and I'm going to mention operating agreement. Uh, I'm going to mention members uh, or managers, so I want to keep that in mind. Uh, some members have uh, active roles in the management of the company. Uh, they, you know, get more involved in a day-to-day operation. And some members basically are investors or passive investors that only want, they do not get involved in a day-to-day operation. But what they do, they basically uh, share the quarterly, the quarterly profits or yearly profits whenever they are distributed pursuant to the uh, agreement of the members of the LLC that they have drafted in the operating agreement. Uh, another important component, which is going to something that I'm going to mention uh, shortly and discuss is basically what is the restriction on the membership? Meaning that the if you're a member of the LLC, say you're a 30% member of an LLC, uh, if you want to sell those shares, how can you do that? Usually in operating agreements, there's a large section, it should be a large section, as to you know how and when that can be transferred. And they usually provisions of uh, that in the transfer of ownership. Uh, very common in operating agreements, you have that the, mem- the ownership cannot be transferred without the consent of the other members. It could be the majority, it could be unanimous. It's up to the members to decide that. That's not a legal decision, that's a management decision. But for the most part, if you're a member of the LLC, generally speaking, uh, you cannot sell your shares, your membership interest to another individual, A, without offering it to the other members first, through a first right of refusal, or uh, without the consent of the other members meaning the other members have to agree to it. Otherwise, they cannot be sold. Uh, In this example that I gave you, uh, in this particular case, the other members did not know. There was no resolution, corporate resolution for the other members agreeing to the transfer of of these shares. Uh, There was no corporate document of any kind, which will lead me to believe that the members of the LLC authorized the transaction, that kind of raised a red flag 
as to whether or not this transaction was approved by the LLC or was authorized by the members, because I don't have any documents to suggest that. Uh, so we went over the operating agreement, the restrictions on transfer is very important. Another a common provision that I see in operating agreement is that uh, how if you're going to sell your shares to if you uh, before you sell it to anybody else, you have to offer it to the current members at the same price. Uh, first right of refusal. Now, if they decide to opt to purchase that or somebody decides to buy their shares from you as the member, there's usually sometimes a, a, a structure for the purchase of those shares. Could be a certain amount of cash down and certain percentage financed over time. And they have a mechanism in place in how that's going to be done. So that's part of the operating agreement and operating agreement drafting is very important for that reason. So I want to at least give you that overview, that context, so then we can talk about what to look for and what mistakes to avoid. Uh, as I've mentioned before in, in prior episodes, and I think not long ago, I went into things to consider when buying a business, uh, five, or five mistakes to avoid when buying a business, five mistakes to avoid when selling a business on my theme of five. So. You know, one of the common themes that I, and I repeat this over and over, and, and I hope that when you have the takeaway, you, you see that why I'm saying this. If you're going to be buying a ownership into a company, I strongly suggest first you get an attorney. And that is basically the premise of my book, Business SOS. And why I say that, yes, a bit self serving, I, I get it. But at the same time, is that the mistakes that are made are not small mistakes. When people are investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in buying a business, buying part of a business, and doing it on a handshake deal, doing it out of trust, doing it out of intuition, whatever you want to call it, it's just it becomes a mistake later on which can cost some one hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you're in a situation that you're about to spend that type of money, my suggestion is to first contact a business attorney who has experience in these types of transactions and pay for a consultation. Five, six hundred dollars for one hour, I could save you hundreds of thousands of dollars. So that's the first thing that I would advise you. Talk to an attorney before you sign any documents and before you actually transfer money to someone else. Uh, number two, due diligence. And we, due diligence is very important. When you're buying interest in a company, uh, it is your responsibility to ask those questions and to ask for financial documents, more than tax returns. You, also, you want to find, there's a whole due diligence checklist, which I've gone over, uh, discussed before, through my show, and I've actually offered it for free. It's the one that I use when I do the diligence for other companies, when I'm representing buyers, uh, or somebody's going to be a seller, and say, well, I'm, I'm thinking about selling my company. You know, like, do my favor, gather all these documents and put them together and prepare them because you're going to be asked of these documents. But have them ready just in case, because you're going to be asked for most of them, so that way you don't have to be scrambling later on uh, at the last minute, trying to gather documents that you should have in the first place if you're going to have your company for sale. But let's go back to the buying side. If you're going to uh, buy interest in a company, you're basically buying that company, whether it's a major minority share of the company, whether you're buying 50%, uh, you know, you're buying, whether it's 10%, you're buying into that company, you're investing your money into that co company. You have every right to ask for all their financial statements for the last you know, th two or three years. You have every right to ask for all their corporate documents, articles of incorporation, minutes of meetings, uh, any type of uh, the operating agreement, any amendments they may have, uh, who are the members of the LLC. You have the right to ask for all that profit and loss statements, uh, litigation. And I'm just giving you kind of a highlight of bullet points that 
that you, we ask for, but it's certainly our pay, our, our due diligence checklist is like four pages long. So clearly I'm not going to begin to read every, every set aspect of it, but you need to know that and you have a right to ask for it. If you're asked for that information and they say, I'm just, we don't have it ready, or I mean, I don't think I need to give it to you. Uh, that's a red flag. That's something that you should basically take a pause and say, you know what, if I'm not having information, I don't know what I'm buying. So you should know that as well. Uh, the reason why somebody's selling the membership is important to know as well. Why is the person selling it? The person is going to leave the company. The person who wants to basically needs extra cash and wants to sell some of his or her interest, and that is fine. But understanding why somebody's willing to sell that portion of the company, it is important to know. Uh, another question that I would ask is, does the other members know of this transaction, of this offer? Uh, and that is overlooked. Uh, we're gonna say, no, they don't need to know, I'm the majority owner and the, uh, the other owners don't need to know, that is fine, I can do this. Uh, that is a red flag. Under an LLC, you know, the other members must approve unless it is agreed upon in the, in the operating agreement that you do not need the member's consent to sell your shares. But that would be documented in the operating agreement and you don't have to, in that case, you have the document. So another thing that I would ask you, I would advise you is that ask for the operating agreement. Definitely article, articles of incorporation, you know, in Florida, you can actually get them because there's some biz.org. So if it's a Florida company, which I'm Florida based, you can go and see the history of when the company was founded. You have the articles of incorporation listed there. Any amendments are actually included and in, uh, they're public in the in sumbiz.org. That's where the Florida Secretary of State has all the documents that are filed. That's where the, the repository, and it's very easy to use, very user-friendly. User uh, all the annual reports that are filed, that we're required to file every year with the state of Florida, to basically say that a corporation or the LLC is active. So you see it there. Uh, you can just look that up. Very, very uh, simple to look it up, very simple to download. But the operating agreement is not published. So whether they decide to upload it there, that's a different conversation. But for the most part, they are not, they're not public documents. You gotta ask for that. If they say, we don't have an operating agreement, but we have partners, uh, what exactly how what do you guys agree to do what is the relationship who owns what and when who has the authority to do what you need to ask those questions before you actually write a check and that's why a business attorney can help you ask those questions you will not know them unless you're actually in the field and you're a business attorney otherwise for the most part you're not going to know this but you're about to invest money into a company you don't know anything about uh, you don't have a trust, and it can be, have devastating consequences. Uh, sometimes, you know, I have people go to financial advisors to consider whether or not to buy interest in an LLC. Uh, that is fine. Listen, any advisor is better than no advisor at all. Okay, please understand everybody has a different role. Uh, so I'm not sure whether a financial advisor or an accountant is going to ask the questions, the due diligence questions that required to for you to know as to you know whether or not you're actually going to be owning an interest in the company uh so that is important to know who you ask the question who, who you ask advice to give advice on this in this matter uh my my suggestion of business attorney should be a start uh but i'm biased of course but i need professional if you get a cpa financial advisor is better than you going trying to go it alone. So I prefer you don't go it alone, get some assistance because it can actually uh, prevent you in a, from making a huge mistake and actually prevent you from making, uh, you know, devastating, you know, loose financial losses. Uh, another point that I like to make is uh, the, if the person, the, the owner is basically evasive as to the tax returns. If you say, look, I want to look at your tax return for the last three years, 
I'll sign an NDA, that's not a problem, but I need to look at them. Uh, if the tax returns are very stale, uh, meaning that they're two years, they're the last year's tax return, there might be the current year, there might be an, uh, an extension, but the prior year, they don't have them, that's a red flag. So you need to look at that as well, and you should be able to have access to that and find out whether those tax returns are prepared by an accounting firm or prepared by the owner himself, him herself. It's a big difference when they're prepared by an accounting firm versus you're doing it yourself. The corporate tax returns are a little bit, they're not as easy to do as personal tax returns that you could do with software. My recommendation is that for a company, an accounting firm should be the one preparing those tax returns to avoid uh, mistakes. Um, the what other points I can give you? Yes. Uh, another thing that I ask that I recommend you ask is, do you have any lawsuits pending? Uh, and the company's currently litigation. That's important to know. Uh, they say, yeah, we have a lawsuit, but it's been handled. Okay, any time that there's a you know minimization or a kind of a, a statement which does not give the importance to a litigation is a concern. So fortunately, now with the public records, you're able to find that out. If anywhere in Florida, if somebody is in a lawsuit, you can look it up to the clerk's office and you're able to pull out through the company name. It'll pull out the company name. You can find out whether they have any litigation or have had any litigation the last five years. They have to disclose that. Uh, something that you're not going to know is whether there has been a threat of litigation against the company. Because usually those come in the form of a letter and you're not going to know that unless a lawsuit is actually filed. Those are examples of the top of the due diligence questions that we ask in our due diligence checklist. And, and we, we also do, we do a parallel. Not only we ask for that information to make sure that they disclose the information, but we also do is we do our own search. We have various softwares and platforms that we use that allows us to search lawsuits all over the country. Uh, you're not most likely not going to have that because you don't do this for a living, but we do. So as part of our due diligence, we double check to make sure that there are no lawsuits that out there pending that have not been disclosed. One thing that we're not going to know is whether or not the part that lost the company is in the middle of arbitration. Arbitrations are not published, only the arbitration award. And I spoke about arbitration a few weeks ago. So if the company is in the middle of an arbitration process, we're not going to know that uh, until an award is actually rendered and filed with the court. So there might be something in between. that You might be in the middle of a legal dispute with a party, yet that has not uh, materialized to a public filing. But they have the, the buyer, the seller, has an obligation to disclose that to you because that is material to the value that he's placing to the shares that he's trying to sell to you. So, you know, and, and the valuation is really a whole different conversation about how to value the business, how to value the shares. But if the seller offers you, I'm going to sell you the company, you know, sell you 10% for $100,000. I'm just using that round numbers to make this example simpler to, to explain. So that means that he's valuing the company at a million dollars. Okay, so where did that valuation come from? That is important. You know, what are the sales of that company? What, when's the last time they did a business valuation? So you have to go ahead and get those questions answered as well and hire an expert that help you with those questions. Uh, last but not least, or one of the last points that I want to make uh, is that you have to know whether the individual who's selling you the shares, he actually owns the shares. Number And number two, whether 
that individual also has the authority to transfer those shares to you. So you could be basically signing, getting a piece of paper that is worthless if you don't verify properly that a the shares can be the shares exist, but we don't know that anybody can go online and create a piece of paper. It's called shares or membership, but you don't know whether that's true or not. And just because somebody's in some this as an officer or a member, that does not tell you what percentage of interest, if any, they own, or they're listed as a manager in the LLC. We know what to ask. We know what questions to ask. We know what to request, and we know how to verify that ownership. There are ways that we can verify that. So you want to make sure that whoever is selling you the shares, A, owns those shares, because you can actually be buying a piece of paper that is worthless. So we know how what to ask. Number two, if that person owns the shares, then you need to ask, does the person have the authority to enter into this transaction? As I mentioned to you before, if the, the, there's a restriction in the operating agreement that the member may not bring other members without the consent of the other uh, consent of the members, and the member tells you, don't worry about it, we don't have to tell them. That's a huge red flag. That's a basically a time to stop and get an attorney to to kind of you know uh, flush that out or, or or reconcile that question. Uh, you know to to make sure that a that person has the authority to do that. Uh, and I, unfortunately, I've seen that before that they in, get into side deals, and because the person who's buying the shares do not know what questions to ask. It is assume I have a share here, I can just transfer it, it's okay. It is my share, I'll become new partner of this company, even though the new members, the new partners, their partners do have no idea that a new partner has been brought in. So does the person have authority to transfer those shares? If that's the case, there should be a resolution of the LLC of the members authorizing that transaction and ratifying that transaction. And you also have to be included in the operating agreement and also in the amended articles of organization to make sure that you are listed as a member if you chose to, if you choose to do so. But at the very minimum, there has to be a document which reflects that you are the new, also a new member of the company. So I've given you some points here that to keep in mind and and the, the uh, takeaway here is that if you're considering buying shares into a company, uh, whether it's an LLC or corporation, uh, especially from a friend or a relative, somebody that you know, don't ignore the formalities. It's for your protection uh, because you're the one writing the check. And I've, I mean, the, the stories that I, I can spend an hour talking about the stories that I've heard People taking their 401ks, people taking their, their kids' college funds for this, whatever venture they want to do. Uh, sometimes they're proceeds from a prior lawsuit or some type of windfall they receive. And this is their hope. They decide, this is what I'm going to do with this money to make it work for me. And they find out that really what they bought was not what they intended to do. And in some cases, they're victims of fraud. And, and these items and these mistakes are preventable by making one phone call. And sometimes I'm surprised. I don't judge anyone. I mean, we take the clients as they, as they come. We all make mistakes. But the purpose of this podcast is for you to avoid mistakes. And, it, you know, and for you to give you that if you're in a situation, you're about to consider doing something like that. Just take a pause, take a breathing, take a breather. Say, you know what? Maybe I should make a phone call. Pay for a consultation, have somebody, what do you think? And have somebody give you the truth about that or say maybe, yes, but let's go through all these questions before you go further. And if they complete all these requirements, then you might decide how to proceed. But at the very least, don't go blind and writing a check to buy into a company that A, you do not know anything about and nobody wants to buy information. 
that is a huge mistake. And then, unfortunately, it is very difficult to recover the money once it is gone. There are legal methods that we have to pursue litigation, but that's then you got to invest more money to try to collect the money that you lost in the first place. And that could all be avoided. One phone call to an attorney. So I hope you enjoyed the podcast. I hope that I gave you some information. I hope that this, actually I like this from the new site from the, my office. Uh, I might do a couple of them just to mix it up a little bit uh, from the studio. The uh, If you want to, if you have any questions about this topic, please send me an email at rich at richsierra.com. If you want to learn more about legal services that we offer, my website is Florida Small Business Legal Center.com. We're at FSB Legal on Facebook, also on Instagram at FSB Legal. Uh, if you want to watch the video of this uh, of this episode, we're at youtube.com forward slash at Richard Sierra. Uh, remember the business SOS, a common legal mistakes, business owners make and how to avoid them. It's available on Amazon and Barson Noble. You can ask for your local bookstores as well. Uh, remember to follow the show. Uh, we're at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to your podcast. Appreciate a five-star review. You want to write something, you can write something as well. Uh, if you are listening, you're watching the YouTube channel, please subscribe as well. Share with your friends. Uh, that's the way other people can benefit from the show as well. Uh, until next week. This is Rich Sierra. Remember that my goal is to help you succeed.